You worry deep in the pit of my stomach when I heard you cough. So I'm glad I found out about undertheweather.ie. It's always open and gives great advice from GPs and pharmacists on how to treat everyday illnesses yourself at home. But you knew that already, didn't you, Emily? <laughs> Undertheweather.ie, from the HSE. You ain't shit! I wish I was 50 years younger you and I'd care. kick your ass. <laughs> My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have, and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life, because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not like Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. All right, you're very welcome along to our Saturday panel. This week we are talking about LGBT experiences in Irish sport. We've got a brilliant panel in studio. We have 10 time All Ireland winning Cork footballer Valerie Mulcahy. I say 10, 12 actually, because you have a couple of club titles as well that we uh, can't ignore. Yeah, I have two uh, junior and intermediate All Ireland, so very happy with that. We have David Goff, inter county referee, and Philippa Ryder, who is a cyclist and a member of Team Ireland at the Gay Games in Paris in August and is also a board member of the Transgender Equality Network in Ireland. There's a lot we want to get through uh, because it's been quite topical this week as it turned out with Gareth Thomas and the horrific attack he suffered and the reaction to that within the rugby community. We had actually planned on having this panel before that became quite newsworthy again. We'll get into some of the issues and some of the topics surrounding the LGBT community in sport in the next couple of minutes. But you might just tell us your stories and your experiences in recent years of Irish sport, Valerie, particularly you, because you only came out quite recently publicly. Um, yeah, I guess it was about three years ago. Mm. Before, I was involved in a documentary that Don Logue um, did, and before that, I would have just, you know, been myself. I wouldn't have been hiding who I was, but I felt there was um, a need maybe to kind of acknowledge it to the wider public because I think maybe people would have found out or heard, and if I wasn't you know, proud about who I was, maybe that they might get a message out of that. Mm. So I felt um, an opportunity arose and I had always thought about doing something proper where it would be, you know, the <coughs> national media and a lovely opportunity came up and I was involved in a documentary that happened to help with the whole, um, you know, the, the referendum. So that aired in January and i um, very happy that I did it because I was living my life as and, and being, you know, me and mm. you know happening to be in in a um, same sex relationship so it was a very natural thing for me to do and i was very comfortable i had like 12 years of being out and being yeah. me and my teammates had accepted me long ago you know when i did tell them and i i obviously just told a small group first and i told my family first and and then that kind of that got a bit easier and i think you know it was very it was very easy for me to do that yeah so when your circle already knew and your <coughs> family and your friends and your local community yeah. It, was there any great reaction to it then? Well, it was actually amazing because I was I got such a huge wave of positivity and so much support from people that I wouldn't have mm. known or who may not have known. Um, and in a way, I was like, I'd love if everyone got to experience that because there is such a fear when you're when you're a gay of like I think the biggest fear is your family not accepting your parents because you don't want to disappoint them. So you know when that's done, like it was just amazing the amount of of love and support that I felt and just, you know, like it, it was lovely for other people to see because it just shows no one really cares once you're you and once you're happy. And I think that's the big message. And you're probably at a stage in your life where you'd been around that Cork squad for a long time. You were used to being a public figure yeah. and you had a good maturity at that stage where you could, if there was any downside, you were probably yeah. in a good position to be able to handle that and to cope with that. From your experiences then over the last couple of years, is there much in place for say 16, 17, 18 year olds? who are coming through and, yeah. and are wondering if they want to make it public. Yeah. Are the support well, networks there? I don't think they really are there, but what I think is the biggest influencing factor would be having role models who are mm. who are themselves, yeah. if they're gay, that they're not hiding it. Yeah. And, you know, there is that, whereas it doesn't maybe have to be national, you know, you know, people will know, and once people are able to just be themselves, and, and I think I was actually at a conference a few years ago um, where it was the, the children welfare officers of each club were up in, in Co Park on National Day and like my message was basically 
don't presume someone's sexuality, kid's sexuality, that they're going to be straight. So, mm. do you know, just for love, don't go, oh, the young girl, like, oh, get up there, you know, mm. you'll be grand before you're married, do you know, or kissed by a boy or whatever. So, you know, just to kind of, um, not, not <coughs> kind of define people or, 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 I suppose, assume. So, let, you know, kind of acknowledge that, you know, they can be whoever they want and, you know, when the, you know people in speeches saying, you know, to all our girlfriends and boyfriends, and you know that's lovely yeah. that they they just inclusive of everyone. That's what I think is is lovely, and, and it has been said a few times even on Steps of Co Park recently, you know, by Dublin footballers and that. So it's it's progressing, but is there structures in place? Not really. I'd like to see a lot more, and I'd certainly be willing to help with that. All right, David, what was your story? Yeah, mine is very similar to Valerie's. Um, I suppose I'd been out long before I ever made a public knowledge in the public domain. I had come out to my family and my close friends. And like Valerie said, just living your own life. I mean, there was nothing um, special about it. We're every bit as unextraordinary as anybody else. But in 2015, with the marriage equality referendum, I saw an opportunity maybe to bring a discussion to the table of GA tables around the country. Because GA really does permeate every level of Irish society. Um, and I tried to wear a wristband uh, to, uh, during a match between uh, Tyrone and Dublin mm. in, in Crow Park and the fallout from that actually created a much greater discussion than ever <coughs> I probably would have been able to help by just wearing the wristband um, and it was a huge eye-opener for me as well and like Valerie like the, the, the feedback and the positivity was absolutely fantastic I can remember going into school on the Monday morning and um, we're both teachers and we both know that at that time we both could have lost our jobs um, because of the legislation um, around the ethos of the schools. Yeah. But the positivity was fantastic and the parents coming to see me on the Monday morning, the children, they brought in baked goods, there was tears. And it was just really nice, it was a really nice experience and I was so fearful going in the gates of the school at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. Uh, you weren't allowed <coughs> to wear the wristband initially, they were... No, the GA you, said okay, it was a... And then there was a last minute change of mind. It was a last minute change of mind. It had been okay from Monday right up until Saturday morning. The match was Saturday evening at 7 and then they turned round at Saturday morning around 8 o'clock and said, look, it, we, we, we can't let you wear it, you can wear it you know, in the dressing rooms and maybe to the side of the pitch, but you can't wear it on to the pitch and I said well <laughs> you know that's just ridiculous I'm not going to hide mm. this mm. you know and they said look at you, you just can't wear it on the pitch and unfortunately with, 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 with being a referee we are answerable to Crow Park and yeah. I was fearful that if I wore it onto the pitch well that was my career finished or my appointments were going to um, drop as a result so I decided not to wear it but the interviews had been done the news articles had been written um, the PR had all been arranged around it and I suppose they changed throughout the day as a result of what was happening in Crow Park and uh, the fallout then that happened from that was yeah, caused did, great discussion. It, it did, and it sparked a debate. <coughs> and I guess the GEA's point of view at the time was that because it was seen as a political statement, that all political statements within the GEA are banned. But it did give rise to an opinion that there were still aspects of the GEA that were quite slow in coming around. Yeah, and myself and Valerie were just talking about it there. I mean, the GA tell us they give us a huge amount of support, but we never really see it in, in, in their actions. You know, <clears throat> there's no LGBT policy within the GA. Mm -hmm. They never fly, <coughs> excuse me, a rainbow flag over Crow Park when every other part of Dublin, mm -hmm. you know, is celebrating, you know, the atmosphere and the positive uh, experience of, of Pride Weekend. You know, there's no physical, uh, um, you know, signs that the GA is actually supporting LGBT. Yeah, I understand that there are plans maybe in the new year that there'll be a welfare officer put out to approach this and to maybe give help to younger people that are involved. Have you had conversations around that with the GA as so to why that isn't happening? I've had it with, with, with certain people within the GA, but not, not at the highest levels. And I'd love those channels to be opened up you know I mean it, it, it's uh, it was difficult growing up as a young person not to have any role model mm. in GA society you know to, to look to I, I, I'm a tennis player um, and there's so many um, tennis players that would have come out over the years we've Billie Jean King Martina Navratilova Amelie Moresmo but we never had any in the GA and we also struggle and I think this is this is quite quite unique um, that you know it seems to be okay for women in sport but it doesn't seem to be okay for men in sport and all the role models growing up were, were female athletes and not male. Mm. Mm. We'll get into that in detail over the next little while. Philippa, tell us your story. Yeah, my story is a little bit different to, to the two beside me here, Valerie and David. Um, I grew up in Ireland in the early 70s. And uh, as a, I mean, I grew up as a, as a guy, as a, mm. I was a teenage boy going to a boys' school. Um, trying to fit in but not quite managing, didn't play any team sports really, um, I just didn't feel comfortable around 
groups of boys. So I concentrated on running and concentrated on tennis, actually, coincidentally, um, as well. I only recently got into cycling um, because in the mid-2000s, I started to address the, um, my situation and decided that I had to transition from male to female. And as a result, um, it, I suffered some difficulties. There, were, there, was, there was a lot of support in those that I, that I told, but I suppose with me it's a little bit uh, more difficult, it's a little bit more obvious because you're transitioning, you're changing from male to female, mm. so it's, it's something that your neighbours are going to see, your family is going to see, and it's, it's, so it's a far more public thing straight away. I tried to be andro as androgynous as I could um, all the way up to the point uh, which I said, okay, I've got to do this, and I got For great. how many years was that? That was for about five or six years. I, I started addressing this within myself mentally from about age 10, you know, but I'm now 57. And this year has just been an amazing year for me because I, I was part of Team Ireland, as you said in the intro. Mm. And I mean, like 139 people went from Ireland to Paris for the gay games, 13,000 participants in the gay games. And we came back with 42 medals. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, like that was... And here I am, age 57, yeah. and representing my country. So that is just... That's the positive aspect. Now, there were a lot of sleepless nights. There were a lot of arguments with my absolutely brilliant wife, my amazing daughter, who's incredibly supportive, and some of my, some of my other um, family members and, and the wider friends circle that I have, you know. What were the arguments about? Telling you you're doing the wrong thing? Yeah, basically, yeah, from from some people, um, not everybody, but saying, you know, uh, it's only a phase you're going through. And I said, um, my my dearly beloved mother, who unfortunately passed away just after the marriage referendum, um, and she said, you know, I would have known. And I said, well, you didn't, Mum, since age 10. I've been doing this, mm. you know, more or less. And uh, so it was extremely difficult and extremely painful. But... It is an area that has to be addressed. And Valerie mentioned it and David mentioned it. And visible role models, visible symbols, even a little rainbow flag on a door to show that, that the business or the sports club or whatever is inclusive of everybody. That's all we need, you know, initially. And then work with uh, organisations. It feels as though we're only now <coughs> starting to get gay role models that for transgender, tra transgender role models, we're yeah. still quite a bit behind. We are. It's often said, actually, Nathan, that um, um, we're about 10 years behind the LGB. Well, I won't even say the B because the B is invisible. But the lesbian and gay uh, side is, is about 10 years ahead of trans. I mean, we've had some great um, people within sport. We've had, um, you mentioned tennis earlier on. Of course, we've got Rene Richards mm. in the 1960s. We've got quite a few um, cyclists, surprisingly. Um, we've got Caitlyn Jenner, who, OK, didn't compete in the Olympics as female, but sin has since the Olympics uh, transitioned, you know. Um, so we've got quite a lot of people um, there, but we need visibility. We need them to come out in their sport and just say, you know, hey, look, I can do it. And that's one of the reasons that I was delighted to get the invite here today to show. I, was, I walked into a stadium with 13,000 people in Paris in August. Come on. With, with an Irish yeah. flag wrapped around me and everything, you know? It sounds, even just from talking to you over the last few minutes, that getting to go to the gay games at 57 has given you a whole new lease of life. It has. It has. Yeah, absolutely. The energy and the, the positivity that I feel mm. as a result of this is just amazing. So I want everybody to have the opportunity to share that. There are probably a huge amount of talking points that we could get into around the issues around transgender people and the issues you're facing at the moment. But trans athletes, it seems, face far, far greater challenges, constant questions cropping up throughout sport about the advantages that are held by trans athletes. Did they crop up at the gay games? Uh, no, they don't. Not, not really, because you, mm. you simply identify in the gender that you want to compete as. So um, there, there are rules, but it's not as strict to say with the Olympics, where you've got, um, you've got very specific, I have a whole history written down of of the way the legislation, the laws within mm. the uh, within competitive sport, have developed over the years from the 1940s, where you needed a femininity cert from a doctor to say that you were female enough to compete as a as, oh, wow. a, as a female, and all the way through 
<coughs> without going into details, but currently to compete um, in, w in women's sport, you would need to have a testosterone level below a certain level mm. and to, to basically identify, self-identify as female. Yeah, uh, this has obviously come to the forefront with Castor Semenya recently, yes. in particular, about the testosterone issue, yes. whereby the IAAF have said, well, the way we distinguish between male and female is on the amount of testosterone that is in the body. Yeah. And that's not scientifically proven, <laughs> but no. this is what they're going with as as their rule. And yeah. it's, it's still not sorted. There's still a huge amount of controversy. It still feels as though we're a long way from getting there. Yeah. Where, where do you see it going over the next three or four years for transgender athletes at, say, World Championships, Olympic Games? Yeah, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to know, really, because, I mean, at the moment, as you say, the testosterone levels, 10 nanomoles mm. per litre um, is, is, the maximum, is the maximum that you can have. Um, but that varies from person to person, from, from woman to woman. Um, and Castor has a very high testosterone level, you know. Um, I suppose, like, it's developing as time goes on. I would hope that it would become more inclusive and more accepting of the fact that, say, for instance, personally, I know once I started taking hormones, my testosterone level dropped considerably, obviously, but also my strength. Within a month, I, I used to be in a gym just around the corner from here, and within a month, my strength, uh, as measured by the, by the guys in the gym, mm. had dropped 20%, 20% within a couple of months, you know? So I know I don't have any, any advantage over, um, uh, you know, women who were, were born and, and identify as female. Mm. Um, it, it's just a case of trying to accept everybody for who they are and set a certain level of criteria of 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 of, uh, le of rules and so on and just work with those it feels like it's a very delicate time at the moment still for trans athletes because yeah. we talk about role models and they're the people who are probably going to make the biggest difference here and you look at some of the examples rachel mckinnon becoming the first yes. trans woman to win a world track athlete spoke about then facing death threats abusive messages mm. around the time of the title win and also her competitors mm. constantly questioning why she should be competing and coming together to try and force the rules to be changed. When yes. you hear that, it doesn't invite people to get involved in sport. No, it doesn't. And Rachel has self-identified as, as female, but is has she's following the rules. She has the testosterone level below. She's mm. had surgery, everything. So, I mean, what more can, 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 can somebody do? If you identify as female, if you want to participate in female sports, set of rules, follow them. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any role models when you were growing up, gay role models? Um, they weren't publicly, publicly. <laughs> <out there. laughs> um, well, I think th that's why I suppose I wanted to be the change yeah. you know, that I, want, I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see in the world. So I kind of did take that role of being a role model seriously, not just for being gay, but like as an athlete, as a female who wants to show that they just want to be an athlete and to be you know, respected as a, as someone who can play football, not, yeah. be, you know, based on their gender or that. But, um, no, I don't think there was too many, to be honest, no. I think, like, Ellen was the first woman on TV that I, oh, uh, that I knew, yeah. right, you know. There was a kind of a lack of it, even mm. among Home and Away or all these things, you know. So it was very rare, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, part of it, I guess, and this probably comes down to probably the GA, all sports, but particularly there's often a focus on Premier League footballers that still there's not an openly gay Premier League footballer. And part of the problem, I guess, for them is that if they were to come out, they can't just come out and do their interview and go back to their mm. life. Mm. They're expected to be an advocate. They're expected to be, whenever these issues comes up, that they're front and centre, that they're educated enough to talk about it, that they need to be the role model. Yeah. Is, was there, is there a pressure? You're obviously at this stage now where you feel comfortable with that. When you were... 22, 23. Oh, there, was, there was a long time there I didn't want to be gay at all and I was yeah. doing whatever I could to deny it or, you know, try not to be. So um, I guess for every person it just depends on when they become comfortable and, and maybe sometimes you do need a little bit of a push or that, you know. So, but I, I do understand how hard it would be for a, an, um, a premiership player to, to come out, but it would be great if, they, if there was someone who was comfortable enough but there is a huge weight of responsibility on them. They'd want, maybe it'd be good if a few of them came out at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it would make a big difference. But I think there's, like I've asked students in a class student, like voting, would you still follow this, the team if someone came out who was gay? Would you, you know, as a player, would you be happy to play with them? But they don't, I think they don't care once, 
once the pr- player who, if they're there to score goals, if they score goals, that's kind of essentially it. Like yeah. they just them want polls them are ridiculous in themselves. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to support yeah. the team. Yeah, because like, there's a game there. Well, yeah. that's not support. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, as simply as that. Exactly. You know. So I think I think there is a maturity that, uh, around soccer that we don't maybe allow, but I would love to see it happen. Yeah, it would be fantastic. It would be fantastic. I mean, we look at Robbie Rogers over in the United States and Thomas Hitzelberger, you know, and John Fashnew in his time, Mm. I suppose. Yeah, 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 it was sad. But like, I mean, they're they're definitely there. It just needs someone to be comfortable enough on their journey to take that next step, you know, and it would open up a huge debate. And I mean, the good that that would do the young people in society is it's uh, unquantifiable. Surprisingly enough, though, um, I was at a conference there in Glasgow about LGBT sports and what the Rangers football club have an LGBT fan group, fan club. I mean, for heaven's sake, and yeah. Celtic as well, you know, and like those, that sort of visibility mm. is just brilliant mm. because you're there with your, with your group and you're, you're there and you're supporting your team, but you're also visible. You know, and that's that's what we need as well as the role models within the teams. Yeah, I guess maybe <coughs> because those two clubs are setting such an example is because they've had to deal with yeah. so much sectarianism inside stadiums that they're constantly trying to make it a safe environment mm, yeah. for people mm, and they've mm. had to open their minds to every type of abuse that takes place in stadiums. Have, have you found at any stage that you've been abused because oh, definitely. of your sexuality? Yeah, definitely, but not by the players or, or management teams. Okay, There's a general level of respect there. I mean... Um, the, the players have, have a huge amount of respect for me and, it's, uh, and it's, um, it, it goes both ways. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, they're covered in rule against uh, you know, homophobic language, uh, uh, sectarian language. Also, referees are not. We're not covered in rule. It's not a specific rule for match officials. But when you go outside that, outside the playing environment, into the stands, that's where the abuse comes. It's a general lack of knowledge and ignorance around it. Yeah, you know, because lack of obviously, understanding. Uh, look, you're a referee for a long time and a very successful referee, you naturally have a thick skin at this stage and you go out to a, a, a club game, to the biggest game in Crow Park, you're getting dogs abused left, right and centre. <laughs> like, do you notice it? When, you you in don't the in Crow game, Park. Do you you, honestly, you don't. Like, I have an earpiece in one ear and the rest is background noise. Mm. Um, but on a uh, Sunday am I not naive to think that if somebody was to sa- shout something homophobic at you, that the people around them wouldn't call them out on it? I don't know. I mean, I, I did experience that in my time in Crow Park and I mean, I was on my way off a field and I just kept going. I didn't want to stop. Mm. And it was embarrassing for me because mm. my umpires are my family. You know, mm. I have an uncle, a cousin, a brother and a father there and they're walking off the pitch with me. They have to listen to it too. And I find that more difficult that they have to deal with it. You know, to a certain extent, I know how to deal with it, but they shouldn't have to. And I, I found that really difficult. Yeah, and I guess that comes back to, again, being an advocate, because what do you do in that situation? Do you stop? Do you make your stand? And it becomes this, it'll be a national front page issue the day after. Or do you just want to, sometimes you just want to get on with your life. Yeah, the part of me would love to make a stand, mm. but I mean, it is a huge issue. And as Why a referee, as a referee, I mean, the only time we're ever in a newspaper is if there is an issue. You know, nobody's coming out of the game <laughs> saying, David Croft is back page the newspaper for being brilliant. You know, it doesn't That's happen. Your job. That's your <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just need to you be know, better. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the only time we ever, we're ever in the newspaper is because of a negative yeah. Uh, yeah. connotation, yeah. you know. Yeah. So if I made a standoff on the sideline of a pitch in Crow Park, I mean, that would just be huge news. And I don't know how it would affect um, me personally and also how the GA would look upon it. Yeah. Maybe it needs that. Maybe it needs that flashpoint, that moment that everybody within the GA needs to start asking themselves some questions. Yeah, but he, he probably wants to ref an all Ireland. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. have repercussions maybe. Yeah. yeah I, but guess I think that sometimes if you, if you if you actually address it in terms of like give them the time you're only adding to it like whereas mm. yeah. it's yeah. hard to gauge yeah. what to do but I think I think I think once you're once you're comfortable in yourself and your family and that's what you were saying it's actually hard f- for them to hear because you're kind of okay with yourself whereas you're aware that they're worried about you you know and I find and that is a worry like I find with spectators I mean they have an opinion on, on on your performance but they don't actually know you so I don't really feel that they have any valid reason to have a personal opinion on you and it, and really if they do it doesn't matter because they don't mm. know me so does it affect you differently to the other regular abuse you get? Oh, absolutely. Every time you hear it, it just chips away at you uh, constantly. Mm. You know, I, I don't hear it so much. Um, you know, when you're at uh, club games, 
um, you, you'll definitely hear an awful lot more of the abuse because there's not as many people there. Right. You mm -hmm. mightn't have your, your headset in. But also in dressing rooms, and uh, you might find this strange, I'm not in players' dressing rooms or in teams' dressing rooms, but my dressing room is right beside theirs. Yeah. You know, and the walls in those dressing rooms are thin, and you can hear exactly what's going oh. on and the language that's used. And just when you're sitting there getting ready for a game, you're at a club game, and someone's making a comment, and it, you know, the language around, you know, um, gay people is used, you know, um, and, and you hear that in the dressing room beside you and you're just, it, part of you just cringes because you know you're going out into an environment where those p players find that comfortable language to use. You I'm know? surprised by that, like, yeah. I know we were saying earlier on, you know, there's a big difference that maybe it's more acceptable in, in uh, with females playing sports uh, for whatever reason, but maybe females, maybe I'm stereotyping, I am, <laughs> uh, are more, com you know, compassionate by nature. Definitely. Or, you know, they have that more emotional side attachment and I suppose maybe more empathetic, I don't know. But I've never, ever gotten one bad word said to me about my sexuality or from the opposition or from, actually in one bad time, nearly, the girl was marking me so tightly, I was like, I have a girlfriend. <laughs> 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 like I, well, that, that's what I do, I yeah. kind of joke about it to yeah. my teammates as yeah. well, so I have the first laugh on myself. But yeah. it's very, that's very disheartening to hear that because, it, you know, it's very sad when I just thought that the G environment was a bit, yeah, more it's, mature it's, it's, it's and accepting. Definitely not on the pitch. I wouldn't hear it yeah. on the pitch, but outside it, you yeah. would. Yeah, it's another side, I guess, of that toxic masculinity it that is. we yeah, spend a lot of time it. talking about. Now, I, like, I just wonder: is there nothing you can do in that situation where before the game and say, "Listen, I've heard some things that are pretty unacceptable." Is, like, when you talk to referees, assessors, when you go back and you talk to county boards no, about no, things I mean, that are I happening, mean, they, they have. Um, I, I generally don't think any referee assessor would be interested in listening. Their job is, is is to look at me applying the rules on the on the field. You know, you just have to deal with. Your their job is uh, surely whose job is it to make sure you're in a safe and comfortable environment when you're doing your job well there's no one like I mean you have nobody there to look after us I mean you're shown to your dressing room and then mm. you're, you're left to your own devices you know there's nobody there really to look after us um, there's match coordinators you know and I suppose if there was anything really really big um, you know I'd bring it to a match coordinator's uh, attention but if it's boys having their banter in a dressing room before the game and I overhear it, there's not much I can do. I just have to deal with that. It's not like, geez lads, I can hear you, you're spending an awful <laughs> like, a lot of time talking about me. Uh, yeah, I just, I just wouldn't bother yeah. with it, you know. Yeah, they're not necessarily talking about you, are no, they? Not, they're not just no. generally, generally using of, yeah. I think just the culture and language their language that they're generally culture. using. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think, and, I mean, I hear it sometimes in, 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 in general circles mm. as well. And it's it's just part of the part of the conversation, you know. And the people don't. And if you do, if you do a bit, make a big issue about it, then it's a. It's we only had to look back at the at the, the rape trial in Belfast to yes. understand the type of language that's yeah. used in the in, in yes. male dressing rooms. I mean, it's no different when it comes to. To, to, to using gay language as well. It's very prominent. Yeah. We are here on our Saturday panel brought to you today by Screwfix.ie championing the trade with the choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. I did mention earlier on that it is quite newsworthy at the moment that we're having this conversation because of what happened. Garth Thomas last weekend, he was uh, attacked, really horrifically attacked in Cardiff uh, and took to Twitter and we can watch the video of what happened the morning after. This morning I've decided to make what I hope will be a positive video. Last night I was the victim in my home city of a hate crime for my sexuality. Why I want it to be positive? Because I want to say thank you to the police who were involved and were very helpful and allowed me do, to do restorative justice with the people who did this because I thought they could learn more that way than any other way. And also to the people of Cardiff who supported me and helped me because there's a lot of people out there who want to hurt us, but unfortunately for them, there's a lot more that want to help us heal. So this, I hope, will be a positive message. There's a different debate, I'd imagine, about restorative <coughs> justice, but he's certainly got his point across and made a far greater point if this had gone to court and had taken several months to play out because there has been a reaction, certainly from within the rugby community, and today we're going to see an awful lot of the teams wearing rainbow laces. Uh, the Welsh team, the French team, Nigel. the All Blacks are all going to come out, Nigel Owens as well. Um, the Irish team and the IRFU haven't really commented, haven't said that they are going to. I think it's going to be left up to the players themselves. We got in touch with the IRFU just to wonder what their stance was because a lot of the other organisations have come out and said exactly what they're going to do. They have said that 
it would be impossible to assist with all requests. We decline the wearing of any emblem, armband or shoelace for anyone cause as to do so would be unfair to the many worthy causes that approach us with similar requests. Unfortunately, there remains a small number of societal issues that are yet to be eradicated <coughs> and we receive similar messages from organisations across a range of issues each year. However, the RFU said they will share any messages of support that the International Gay Rugby post on social media. The values of rugby are of paramount importance and we try to ensure that those involved in our games are clubs and indeed those who attend our matches observe these at all times we have confirmed we're happy to share the messaging and as part of the spirit of rugby programs we try to ensure that our values of respect and inclusivity are shared supported and observed through this program we build a welcoming and safe environment for all those involved in our games is that fair enough I'm going to disagree with that straight away. We just spoken mm. about the, yeah. you know, the visual impact this is going to have, you know, and 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 I think you know it's an opportunity lost that Irish rugby are, uh, you know, have the opportunity afforded to them to wear this, not specific to any of their players, mm. but in support of, um, uh, you know, homophobia in sport, and uh, it really is an opportunity lost if you see all the other teams doing it. That doesn't mean it's right. But, I mean, this is a very personal issue and they should be able to get behind one of their own. The IRFU have had the pride flag above their offices. They have been supportive of the gay rugby team and there's a big tournament the Emerald Warriors, next yeah. year, the Emerald yes, Warriors. Yes. And have got behind that and are very much invested in that. So they, they have shown support. But... Is it important? How important is it that you do see leadership from the very top at times like this? Yeah, it's, I think it's very important. Um, as part of Team Ireland, we're, we're planning on uh, um, setting up a national LGBT sports organisation mm. because physical and mental health is uh, so much helped by being involved in sport. And we've had discussions with Department of Justice. We've had, dis uh, we've had a chat with uh, some uh, uh, reps from the IRFU as well. They're very supportive and so on. So we're anxious to talk to the GAA. And I think it's just, it's just <coughs> vital that as many symbols and as many visible uh, ways to show support are used because homophobia and transphobia within the, within the sporting community, it is there, it's an undercurrent. And let's, let's try and stamp it out in whatever way we can. Yeah, as I was gonna say, as luck would have it, but the way these things fall, Australia are playing England today and England have said it's up to their own players if they want to wear them they'll be certainly made available and likewise Australia but playing for Australia will be Israel Folau who made some pretty despicable mm. comments which we don't need to repeat which he put down to his religious beliefs and I often wonder after an incident like that and the debate that happens and he's come out and he's been widely condemned by the vast majority of people even though no action was taken against him by the Australian Rugby Union like, when you hear about oh it sparked a debate is is that something you look at as a positive? <laughs> no, I don't know if Do I you ever feel the debate around when people make outlandish, shocking comments that the debate and the positive message that comes back, it's, can there be positives from that debate? Well, there can, but I think as, as people, we always hold in, hone in on the negative and we're kind of drawn to the yeah. fear and, yeah. mm -hmm. and you always remember the bad comment, not the hundred good ones. So, yeah. you know, it depends on how vulnerable the person hearing that is. So that, that's what would be a worry. Um, but just in relation to the laces, I actually have uh, been on to the uh, woman in England when they were doing, th uh, to try and receive rainbow laces yeah. before the referendum. And we are rarely on the telly, but we had a league final, so we were going to have a bit of uh, airtime on TG Car. And I just happened to get the package like an hour before the match. <laughs> and I handed them out, kind of expecting everyone that would just change their laces when they were like concentrating on the match. But I was off, obviously thinking about my match, but the bigger issue of this referendum and how it was going to impact me and everyone else. Um, so actually it was great. Five of the girls and myself had the laces on and, you know, that support was uh, I think amazing. I see the photo up there for yeah. anyone who's oh. watching on our social like, channels. That just meant so much that, you know, given that they were in their zone for the match, they were still willing to change the laces and put them on and show their support. And um, now we didn't go through any channels of, can I get, can mm. I get permission? But... Uh, <coughs> Whoops. Uh, so, but that that was that was. But why fabulous. would you need permission? No, you don't. No, but you know the way they it seems well, everything seems yeah. to be political these days. Yeah. No, you don't need it. But I did kind of um, say it to the the commentator beforehand. I was like, look, I'm wearing these. If you could mention it, great. And he was like, well, I'll have to be uh, the balance. So I'll have to say, and the the opposition Galway aren't going to be wearing them. But uh, you know that was his way of getting mm. around it.
Mm. I guess as well when you hear comments like that and it does start a debate as they say like chatting to the three of you here you're all mature enough I think to take a lot of what is said and brush it off and move on with your lives but when you look at the statistics around particularly young trans- transgender people yeah. like they're shocking the rates of depression of attempted suicide that one stray comment by a very very public figure particularly an international rugby player yes that it can have on a young man or woman it's like it can be devastating yeah no it's 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 something that i mean the, as you say the stats for statistics are uh, f- sorry for suicides are pretty awful you know um you, you'll find that about 75 percent of trans people have have con- contemplated suicide and about 40 percent have actually attempted it you know and for younger people i mean isn't suicide one uh, the the major cause of death for for, mm. for young young kids so there are organisations out there, the likes of Belong To and Transgender Equality Network Ireland, that deal with the issues around trans people. Um, I think just try, to try and get, get kids involved, because as people, as, as LGBT people uh, become older, they become less in, interested, they become less involved in sport. It's something like 60% of LGBT people uh, are basically unfit as opposed to 40% of the general population, you know? And so we have to promote sport as a way to get people active and to reduce the obesity rate. Is that because of maybe the exposure of having to, you know, wear shorts and different clothes, or is it more, I don't know, what is it? just not a welcoming environment? It's not a welcoming environment, no, no. People are very worried about, you know, uh, like, as, as, say, as you get older, you're expected to get married, to have kids and everything. And, and so suddenly, you know, if you try and come out at, 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 as, as you're older, it's, it's a very difficult situation mm. to be in, you know. What do you see as, are the solutions then like, to, that can help stop homophobia in sport? Things that we can do in the short term, things you'd like to see done in the long term? Yeah, well... Um, how long have we got? Because <laughs> there's a lot of as things. As long as you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things. That is to <laughs> there's a lot of oh, things. Wait, there's five pages there. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, listen, get people involved in sport. Sport is brilliant for mental and physical well-being. Um, get the clubs to set up LGBT liaison officer or whatever. Um, link in with all the relevant national organisations. The likes of Tenny belong to LGBT Ireland and so on. And just be out there promoting sport as a way to to be included mm. and for, for the betterment of, you know, of everybody, really. One of the things that you said that I don't know why it surprised me was that actually you don't have to be gay to go to the gay games. Yes, that's right. That surprised me too. Yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> because, it, because obviously... Yeah, because we can't discriminate, can we? you decide. <laughs> it's counter, you know, it's, it's reverse discrimination. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it probably yeah. opens up as well, actually, for gay people who may be worried when they're going into a club for the first yeah. time. You don't have to go by yourself. You, you yeah. can bring your friends. Yes. Nobody's going to turn you away. Of course, of course. And I mean, like the gay games in Paris this year were just incredible. And so the new organisation that Te- Team Ireland are hoping to set up will be based around two strands. It'll be based around the, the mental and physical well-being. And we'll be hoping to go out and give talks and so on, encourage people. But then there would also be a competitive level mm. element to it, whereby people can just start couch to 5K, right? which I'm doing, I'm a cyclist, but I'm, I decided to take up running as well just because nothing else to do, you know. So, yeah, couch to 5K, that gets people off the couch and into, involved in something and then develop from there and go maybe to the next level and get involved in a sports club. And then if they feel up to it, go to the gay games, you know, or like there's the Euro Games in Rome next year. Hong Kong in 2022 will be the World Gay Games. I might I mean, go to that actually myself. Yeah, that yeah, very so good. I'm planning to go as well to yeah. play right. the tennis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Play with the out to tennis group here in Dublin yeah. and we play on a GLTA World Tour. <clears throat> and there's tournaments every other weekend in different cities around Europe, United States, um, Australia. And like like Philip has said, there's there's straight people play at those tournaments. I'm only back from a, a tournament in Antwerp, a mixed doubles tournament, and we played against straight couples or you know you know one partner in in the couple was Brilliant. straight and one was gay and mm. it's totally fine. It's it's no problem, it's just yeah. a game of tennis. Great. Get yourself a World Championship medal to go with all those All Irelands. Be fantastic. Yeah, Iceland, yeah. Yeah. Iceland. Sorry for our cup, Irish. Yeah, the World Cup. Four years. 
I would have brought my two, my, my three medals in from the gay oh, games, oh, but okay. they're framed, so it would be too uh, heavy and everything. Yeah, but all right, next time, next <laughs> time. I've played my display. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> two pockets, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, we're, we are coming towards the end. I'll get some of the texts and comments that have been coming in. But if there was something then that you'd like to see happen over the next year, eighteen months within the GEA to very simply just something small I'd love to see them fly a rainbow flag over Croke Park on a championship weekend when Pride has been celebra celebrated in Dublin that would be just huge maybe we'll climb up ourselves yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah I'll be with you yeah, yeah. 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 I'll, do, I'll do the skydive after <laughs> <laughs> what about you Valerie um, I actually think something as simple as that would be, mm. be lovely um, because if you can't get something as simple as that there's no point you, know, you don't yeah, have to wish for too much more no. yeah, yeah. Like it, it does make a difference, even in Cork, you know, and the city hall, they have the pride flag up, and and you're entering the city, and there's, um, you know, banners and welcome, and and it's just it's just lovely. It's kind of yeah. heartwarming. And there's always matches in Dublin that weekend. It's usually Leinster Championship. I usually miss the the pride parade because I can't go out because of matches the next day. But um, yeah, it'd be just something very yeah. very simple and effective, and it would have you know a, a huge image. A, a su surrounding it like a, a pride flag in Crow Park you know Crow Park belongs to everyone in the country it's it's just fantastic absolutely I think it's definitely something we'll come back to in the new year and see if we can help make that happen a lot of texts and comments coming in as you'd imagine can I recommend a podcast it's called Sports Are Gay and it's presented by two Canadian ladies of the LGBTQ community they're not sports experts but are trying to get into it they talk to gay sportsmen and bring up gay sports news every week they had an Irish lad on a few weeks ago says John in Sligo mm. have you heard of it? fantastic no, but no. I will. No. well there just a recommendation okay. from one of our listeners Great, Michael Kinahan delighted that you're covering this topic big question is why have Irish rugby not joined other nations in showing their support for Gareth Thomas we touched on that it does feel like it's a massive missed opportunity D there may be players hopefully that will oh, yeah, come I, on mm, wear it I would imagine assuming that they all get those rainbow mm. because they are hard to come by very hard to come the by. English rugby union mm. said that again they were going to make them available but that some players were thinking it was just too much hassle because they'd have to change the laces oh yeah. god love them. Like, bloody very but I'm sure someone would love dealing. to tie their yeah. boots. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't lace their boots. It, it, yeah, exactly. Uh, I play a hurling in the northwest. I'm over 50. I'm not happy being a gay man due to sexual abuse, but I'm addressing that. As for GEA, I have my shower after everyone else and still get a lot of slagging, not banter. I found it very difficult. And that is one thing. Yeah, there is I a found huge difference difficult. between slagging and banter. Mm. Yeah, I found that very difficult when I came out first. I, um, I just had a mental block around... Um, you go, you know, changing after the games, mm. um, and uh, you know, it stopped me playing for a while uh, because it's a it's a misconception, really. Like it's your own personal fear. Generally, the lads had no problem yeah. sharing with me before or after I came out. How did know, you get over it? I just they said it to me. I was at home in, in Slane one weekend. This one of the lads came up to me and he just said, "Look, we really hope you didn't stop playing because you know you're after coming out. We want you to be part of a team. You're a valuable member of the team. You know I had played with them since I was seven. You know, and uh, I really missed it. And I went back for a number of years before the refereeing took off. Yeah, that's, that's lovely good. that they you know oh, he was fantastic. It was lovely that they came great. over to yeah. me. Yeah. I I just have one amusing story. Uh, around rugby, actually, in changing rooms. Um, when I was transitioning, I was using a gym just around the corner that I think I mentioned earlier on. And uh, so I was using the men's changing room. I was androgynous, so I had a, kind of a bit of a handbag on my gym kit and stuff like that. Anyway, I was using the, the men's changing room to change, usually when it was quiet. One Sunday morning, I walked in. Handbag wasn't paying much attention. Anyway, walked into the changing room. Who was there? The Irish rugby squad. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. <laughs> <laughs> so all my female uh, colleagues were very jealous of me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. How did they react? Um, I won't say it on air. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they were great. They're they were fine. great. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, and finally, Mel on Facebook. As a Dublin died in the blue supporter, can I say that David Goff has always been fair when refereeing Dublin? David B. Gay or not makes no difference <laughs> to me. It's his fairness throughout the game is all I'm interested in. And to date, that has been 100%. Oh, thank you very much. That's lovely to hear. Well, that's typical. We've only dubs texting in. <laughs> what have you done to all the other counties? Screwed us over know. constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That that's not a, that's not going to be good for your career though. Getting <laughs> well, as, as a proud, <laughs> as as a very proud mead man, I'll never take, uh, I'll never, I'll never, you know, wouldn't take compliment from a dub. The Saturday panel today has been brought to you by Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a choice of over twenty thousand quality trade products. I think we only scratched the surface of mm -hmm. this. Hopefully, it's something we can come back to again over the coming months. Uh, but thanks a million for coming into the studio. We've got a big reaction to it. We'll pass on any of the messages as well and keep them coming to five three one zero six. We'll take a quick break.
Listen back to your favourite news talk shows at newstalk.com and on the News Talk app. In music, you'll find 12 notes. They can start down here and go right up here. Harmonise them and you get a perfect range indeed. But there is another. Because during the Audi Experience 191 sales event, you'll find the entire Audi range at your local authorised Audi dealer now. Oh. Sounds good, right? Audi. Vorsprung durch Technik. Oh. Find the perfect Audi range during the Audi Experience 191 sales event at Audi Centre, Bracken Road, Sandyford, now. Do you like beating the shopping rush and stocking up early for Christmas? Then Lidl have more for you. Like our luxury proline assortment, only $5.99. Tasty spiced biscuits, just $1.49. And our assorted deluxe fudges, an amazing $1.69. Just make sure the family doesn't find them before the big day. Lidl, more for everyone this Christmas. Black Friday deals are now live at littlewoodsireland.ie. There are thousands of discounts across fashion, electricals, homeware and more. With free delivery and free returns on all orders. Shop today at littlewoodsireland.ie. Free returns are through Parcel Connect or Parcel Motel. Terms and conditions apply. See 